So, it's Friday. And what am I doing? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm prepping up to do a tad of plastering. It's not old school plastering, no. We're going to be doing a bit of over skimming for somebody. Kind of going back to my roots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a step by step guide of how we undertake over skimming of walls and ceilings, including fixing the beads and applying PVA to the walls, etc. Now, if you're a plasterer, you'll know exactly what we're doing. However, you may not be a plasterer and you're curious. So if you are, enjoy. Right, so step one. PVA. Now, if you're having a go, don't go to your um, well-known DIY store and buy their cheap PVA. Because you'll end up putting about 50 coats on to stop any suction. This is a, a contract one. Um, it's good quality. I get it from a, a supplier that's that's like online. You, you can't buy it, you've got to be trade, etc. So what we do, we basically apply PVA to the ceiling first. Now make sure that you put down something on the floor if you're keeping the carpet. If you're not keeping the carpet, use it as a big dust sheet until you're done. Right, let's crack on. So what we, we have here is our, I think it's a painter's paintbrush container. I've had it for quite a few years now. I seem to have lost the lid though somewhere along the line. And just a box standard paint roller. So we put our PVA into there and we use the roller to apply it. Now some say that you can water your PVA down to 50-50. I prefer not to. Um, just a tiny bit of water just to thin it out a bit. You know that way that it's sealed what you're going on to because there's nothing worse than having your first coat going on and it pulling in because your PVA's failed. So we're going to avoid that and do it less than 50-50. Probably do like 10% water in most PVA or 90% PVA. First of all, fight with the lid to get it off. There we go. We've not done this for quite some time. Probably the best part of a year since I last uh, did a plastering job anybody but uh, I'm going to start doing one or two now. kind of missed it. Missed the old plastering. You can see it's very thick this one. It's, uh, it's not like your cheap PVA. So the best way to do your water to water down your PVA is put your, your bottle is fairly empty. Put some water in it. Pop your lid back on, very important that you pop the lid back on. And then you give it a good shake. And what that's done is it's got all the residue PVA off that's sticking all over the uh, the cam, so to speak. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. Okay, so we can now get our roller and slot it into that PVA. Give it a good mashing together. Making sure that the, the water and the PVA are mixed together. One thing that you don't want is big wads of PVA 
onto the, the wall or ceiling that you're doing because then this will present you with problems later on because what happens with the, the PVA especially when it's fresh you put it onto your, your substrate your, your wall or your ceiling and it'll leave it to set in even to the next day and you then put your plaster onto it your plaster then reactivates PVA it wets it up it goes goes wet again after time so if you've got big globules of it those big globules won't have set at all and they'll bleed through so your whole plaster works so when you're traveling up it starts dragging and makes a mess of everything plus there's always a chance it'll come off if you do that so make sure it's a nice even coats now you can give it a couple of coats you, you can fire it on Especially if it's un untreated plaster work, i.e. plaster work that's not been painted. Um, so you could give it a couple of coats if need be. Now if you're going on to something that's got very high suction, for example, lime plaster that's never had paint on it, and you're gonna you're gonna overskim it with the gypsum plaster. What I suggest you do is is use something like SBR on it first, or let that completely dry out, and then a couple of coats of PVA, and that should sort you out with that. Right, so that's now, now ready to go. So the next step is we're going to put a little bit of the old uh, plastic sheeting down on this carpet. It is changing the carpets, but he's got to live with it until we're done. So we will sheet it up for him um, just to basically stop any mess. Now this particular wall is bare plaster, there's no, um, no paint on it. So what's going to happen is we're going to put on this PVA and it's going to suck in that plaster. Which means that we'll still have suction on it when we cover to skin. So how we combat that is we give it a few coats of PVA. So we'll put this coat on, we'll let that pull in, let it go tacky, and then we'll apply a second coat to it, and that should stop the suction. As you can see, up and down strokes. Making sure you've covered every square inch because again if you don't if you have little areas that you've missed you'll get suction the suction is bad and now just a, a quick one for the uh, the younger masters out there that uh, do this day in day out bear in mind I've been doing this for now over 40 years and this is how I've been doing it for 40 years and in my entire career I have never had a job fail using PVA I know a lot of you like to use the grits the blue grit green grit but um, I do use it sometimes especially on Artex, things like that. But this kind of work, PVA, every time it works. We, we don't need to be messing about with SBRs and PVA mixes, etc. Like I said, I've been doing it 40 years and never had one fail. Good reputation. So that's how the old boys do it. Can't stress more, don't use cheap PVA.
And it's important that you get it nice and flat as well on the PVA because if you've got something like drips or runs in it and that hardens, when you come to overskin, they'll trace through, you'll see them and they'll look awful. So you've got the general gist there of what we do with your PVA. Get it on nice and even, not too thick, not too thin. Double coat it. If it's raw, plus the work you're going on to. If it's painted, you should only really need one coat um, because the paint has taken the suction away for you. Right, so that's that's the PVA bit done. Okay, that's everything PVA'd. It's all had two coats. So next we've got to put some beads around that window. And also, we've been in here and we've given all this a couple of coats as well. That's not being done. So this is... Uh, this is all we've got to do on Saturday. We shall fly through it without any problem. So next on the list is like I say, we've got beach spun on there. And then there's a couple of chases because this place has had a rewire, hence the, the replaster. Now to there, and what I've done, I've put some PBA into the chase. And the idea behind that is to stop the suction when we uh, float in the patches. The one there. And I suppose you're wondering what the black is. Well, it's basically a two inch paintbrush I used. It's got soot on it, that's all. So I'm not taking it all. Little patch down there to do. Again, I put plenty of PVA on it. It stops suction. And I'm going to use uh, bonding to, uh, to do the patches because that's pretty much all we can get around here. Um, so the bonding will stick to the PVA and the PVA stuck to the brick and so on. So that uh, makes for a good job. Okay, off to the builders merchants now to get some gear. Right, so let's have a look at some of the basic tools that we'll need to undertake this work. Right, this is what is known as your laying on trowel or Famous terms, plastering trowel. This here, I don't, don't use it that often, but it's known as a flexi trowel. A um, bit of muck on it there, actually. And that you'd use, well, I use it for final trowel ups, um, just to give a nice smooth finish. You don't have to have one of those. Uh, and then really a selection of different size spatulas because there's lots of little areas that you can't get in with your laying on trowel. Um, also handy when you're doing corner to corner, wet corners, wet angles as we, we call them, you can run it in with that. A little marsh down Dwarf trowel. <coughs> Again, we're getting into those little areas, which there are a lot of on this job. And then, good old flat brush, dipping in your bucket of water, flicking it on the wall. Now, you can use a pump bottle and spray it, but I'm old school for the, your flat brush. 
which I've got several of. Also, I'm going to be needing tin snips for cutting the angle beads, which we're going to fit shortly. And then you need your paddle mixer and a selection of buckets for water and mixing in, as you will see when we start to skim tomorrow. I've also picked up some of these, probably won't use them. However, these will slow down the setting speed or the setting rate of your finish. So if you've got, for example, a, a big area and you need some, as it says on the packet, some extra time, this stuff is great for it. Uh, you can pick them up pretty much at your, your builder's merchants. Um, and this one is half time, which again, this, uh, well, it accelerates it. It does, does the opposite. It, it'll make it set much, much quicker. Now, you don't have to, to purchase this stuff um, if you are doing a lot of plastering, you know, if you're a plasterer. Uh, you can actually use uh, aluminium oxide, um, which is pretty much what this is. But uh, easy enough, just pop to your builder's merchants and get a couple of packs of this and slip it into your, your mixes. Right, and then, uh, of course, a, a bucket trowel. But you're desperately needing a clean. Mm. I do have a clean one somewhere, but I don't think I brought it. And that's that's pretty much the tools that you'll need to undertake an over skimming job. Um, you know, it, it's not a case of you turn up with a, a trowel and hand board. And what's a hand board? Well, known as a hawk. I have several of those, all different sizes. Uh, but I use them for different different types of uh, plaster work. Okay, let's have a look at what we're going to use to put on the walls. Now this is what we're uh, we're going to be using, which is known as multi finish. You have two varieties of finish, which are, are the most common. You have your multi finish and you have board finish. Board finish, you could potentially use it for over skimming. Um, but you're better off using it just for board. Um, you know, it's it's multi finishes more for for going onto floats, etc. And then upside down, obviously, uh, a bag of bonding, which we're going to use now to fill out these uh, chases made by an electrician. Right, let's mix some bonding. I've not had a quick haircut. This is horse hair. Now, we won't be using horse hair in our backing coat for this particular project. Reason being, it doesn't require it because it's a modern gypsum based plaster. However, if I was doing it with lime, I'd be using the horse hair in the mixture to basically strengthen it. Right, so we've got our mixing tub and we've got some fresh, clean water. I'm going to put some down there into the tub. What we're going to do now is we're going to add some bonding. Now it's important, don't put your powder in first and then your water. Always put your water in first. Okay. Rip the bag open from the top. They always have a little little pull bit that you can get hold of and open it up. Now you could go to the extremes of working out how much water per litre you need per, per kilo of but we, we don't go down that road. If you're doing it too long to mess about like that. So we get some lovely big handfuls. Put them into there, like so. And nobody say it, you should have a mask on. You should be wearing goggles, don't say it. Oh, 
but we carefully knock that in with the trowel. Now because we're only mixing a bit, we're not going to bother with the paddle mixer. Do my aggravation, setting it up, using it, cleaning it, putting it away. It takes too much to do it this way. And you don't want it too dry. But then you don't want it too wet either. It's the old uh, just right routine as usual. I mean this bonding, I suppose it's as, as close as you're going to get for how it feels if you're using a, a fresh lime plaster, um, which would be a quick lime plaster as opposed to an NHL, because it's it's light and it's sticky. And that's what your, your lime plasters are like. They're, they're quite light and they're sticky compared to, for example, a cement mortar plaster. Okay, so that's now mixed. That's now all mixed and done. So what we need to do next is get our, our hook and our flat brush wet up the hook. And then you want your lathe on travel. Now I have, I have several. This is uh, an older one I use for doing things like bonding and floats, etc. Right. Well, that knocks off some of the water from your flat brush. And then get yourself a little bit on your board, just a bit. There you go. And it'll stick on your hook. If you don't do that and it's wet, you'll, you'll go to pick it and it'll slide off. Nice and easy. Right, let's turn you around and show you how we apply it to the wall. <coughs> now this is this here. It's one of my pet hates. You leave the radiators on and say, can you go around it? Well, it's half a job. Anyway, a little bit in here. We're not putting as much on there. Again, there's a, a dip. I think there must have been a wall or something here because it's, it's two different levels either side of the chase. So we've got to even it out with the bonding just to. Uh, just to lose it best we can. Being careful of the, the lovely new chrome sockets, of course. And we need a small spatula. That one will do. Just to get down the side of the socket. The, all of the sockets and light switches and light fittings will undo tomorrow when we come to do the skimming so we can get behind them. For obvious reasons we'll not do it and leave it overnight because the chap has to live in here. So the, the little spatula there just gets a bit of a jump down the side of the socket. And there you go. That's pretty much I think the bonding. Um, done. Uh, there is there is one tidy bit so big just through there um, which I'll tattle and you can uh, go and get a brew. <coughs> okay so that's the bonding all completed now. See the, uh, the patch just there behind me. Also, what I've done is this. Now, the reason that I've done that is because there's a massive hump in that wall. And, of course, the wall ceiling angle, you can see there, is, is quite quite severe with this, this bump that's in there. Now, what I could do, if I wanted to get that perfectly straight, 
it'd be to bond out the whole top end of that wall to get it get it fairly straight however um, I don't think we're going to be doing that on this particular job because there isn't a straight wall <coughs> excuse me there isn't a straight wall in the place um, and I don't think he's right bothered however the ceiling I don't know if the camera picks that up but there's a huge bump in the ceiling there with several cracks now it's a poster board ceiling so what I'm thinking is if I can try and push that board up without breaking it and put some drywall screws into the um, ceiling spars uh, hopefully it'll pull that dip out a little bit but it, it's up and down everywhere now the last job I did in this property for this chap was a bedroom ceiling which uh, was completely removed and I reboarded and skimmed it but it doesn't want to do that with this one so uh, there we go we'll do what we can right gang what we've got here is what's known as a skim bead and you can see obviously it's like a, a mesh type thing where your, your plaster will go through and adhere to the uh, substrate these little holes um, back in the day we used to use um, clout nails to fix them to uh, stub petitions etc um, you can get some stuff these days where you can stick them on with like a, a sticky strip you can staple them glue them with no more nails you name it there's all sorts of ways you can fix them what i'm going to use today is a little bit of uh, multi-finish just to bed them on there which uh, will do adequately now the reason i'm going to do that and i'm not going to use a, a mechanical fixing like a nail or a staple is because these are a a solid Harris corner done with a, a cement render. Now I know this because I've worked on these uh, particular properties before and if you try and put a fixing into that what it does it just splits it off there so you end up with a chunk of that coming off and no fixing for your bead. So we're going to bed them on. Um, normally I'd do it with a little bit of drywall adhesive but I'm not buying a full bag of drywall adhesive to put on a meter and a bit of bead okay let's see how we cut these beads right well this is where the old um timothy snipping guns come in the old tin snips the old metal cutting bead so the first 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 job that you do is get your tape measure and you measure the size of bead you require we'll do it in feet and inches because i'm old so that's 37 and a half inch. And we put it on the end of the bead, measure down, there we go, 37 and a half inches. With the tape measure, and we get our safety beads. Snip it that way, turn it over, snip it the other way. And it's in two, nice and simple. Now, you'll see in the, in the middle there a bit, you put your, your snips to the middle and then you turn it around, you do the other side. So what you're doing is you're cutting through that edge because you don't want that edge damaged really because that's, that's giving you a nice corner. And then we check it and we see, right, so we're slightly too big. Which is fine, it's fine, it's not a problem. So what we do, get rid of that one. What we do is we just snip off a little bit more. And this cut edge is going to go to the edge of the wall where it's not needing a bead. So we've got the uncut edge, the nice machine cut perfect edge we're going to use to join the other bead to to form the square corner. There we go. Now that, that bead there is sitting nice at that end and nice at that end, but it's not touching in the middle, which says to me that there's a bow in the middle. Right, so we put that to one side now and we measure up for the next bead. 
again. We'll do it in inches because I'm old. 34 inches. So that's going to get us all the bead we need out of one 2.5 metre bead. So you can do metric. I think I said 34 inches. We shall see. Right, to the middle. Can you see there? And turn it over. Same the other way. Snip it off. And again, that's an uncut edge. So that will go to the top. Like so. Perfect. So the next process is to knock up the tiniest little wad of finish to bed them on. Okay, so I've knocked up a, a bit of the old multi finish. So you don't want it too wet, because don't forget you are using it to bed the bead on. It's a tried and tested method by the way. This is how we used to do it many many years ago. And it was for the what were called roughing beads, which were angle beads, similar to the skin beads, only a bigger mesh and a bigger profile on it. And that was to give you a nice square plum corners on things like brick and block work. And we used to bed them on with a bit of the old finish. So, the good old faithful spatula trowel. We know that it's quite deep in the middle there, so we'll put a, a generous helping plaster up there. And then we get to underneath as well. Not quite as big a lump underneath. So, and then before we get carried away, we'll just take that bead off there. The uncle touch, there we go. And push her on nice and gently, making sure that the finish is oozing out of it. And then what we do. Make our lines a bit easier, get the old fork and carefully remove the excess. Okay, so what we do with that is we let it pull in, probably about 20 minutes, and then we get our flat brush or the two inch paint brush, and we just gently clean it up with a bit of water, which smooths the bead off, ready for skimming. So we've got a great big lump of your company at the bottom of this reveal. Remove it. <coughs> There we go, get that off there. Decorator's cork or silicon or something horrible like that. There's a great big wad on the bottom of the window board. Right, that's got rid of that. Same procedure, we uh, don't need as much on the um, the side here because obviously gravity isn't trying to pull it off. Nice 
Now bear in mind that the, the wall that we're doing has already been PVA'd. So that PVA will react, it will go soft and sticky, and as the plaster dries, the PVA will dry and the two stick together. Right, let's see if this bead will fit. Let's check that top one in a minute, make sure it's square on. Right, we're going to snip a tiny little bit off the end of this one because it is ever so tight. Put it on a little bit of a, a V. And that way it's not catching on the, uh, the window board, which is a bit, a bit you know. There we go, on she goes. Right, I'm making sure that the, the two bees join together perfectly. You don't want any little ridges on it because that will give you grief when you come to skin. So the, the bees need to be touching right the way around or flush around with each other, if that makes sense. Again, there you'll be excess. Boring. I go over with the uh, the brush, the paintbrush. That's the beading done. So now so we're going to take a look at this uh, this mess on the ceiling and see what we can do with it. See what we can do with it. Now so we're going to use some drywall screws. And this breed. Or 35 millimeter. It might not be long enough, but it's all I have with me. So the weapon of choice, the old impactor. So first of all, we've got to we've got to try and establish where the uh, ceiling spars are. which is not going to be easy because of the uh, dip that's in the ceiling. All we will try here. Right, so we've not got one there. It says they're not running that way. So which way are they running? Ah, that's the way they're going. So we've established that the joists are going from front to back of the property. So there should be one. Hmm. It doesn't feel like there's one there, but it's going to be a case of uh, going to be a case of trying to find where the ceiling spars are now. So we know which way they're running. So we'll have a, a bit of a guess at one. Minute. Nope, not there. So we keep going. It's very mind, it's going to go over skim. We keep going until we find a ceiling spot. Yes. Awkward. No. I don't think these screws are going to be long enough because it's this this board is down so far. It needs ripping out really and redoing, but what can you do when they say no? See that's going into the spar, but it's 
pulling the board up. Very awkward. Trying some of those. Not that stock that's been in there many years, that. Loading stock. There it goes. Right, so Worth a shot, isn't it? So the next process of the sealing would be the old uh, tape. Now what we're going to do, we're going to double tape the cracks. The reason we're going to double tape it is, is because it gives it a bit more strength. Because this ceiling is buggered. But uh, we don't really want the cracks coming back. So we use the, the old fibre tape to stop them reoccurring. Now this is the, uh, the tape. It's a good quality one again. We don't want uh, cheap tape because it basically doesn't stick. And you normally cut it with a, a standing knife, but the sharp edge of the old trowel will suffice because my knife is in the van. And I don't fancy going down to get it again. I keep going up and down like a damn yo yo. So, The old trowel, strike it across, it's cut. Because the edge of the trowel is quite sharp. And you just put the tape on, it's self adhesive. And because we've PVA'd, this is slightly tacky as well. So the two will stick together nicely. Any little hairline cracks, whether it be on a wall or a ceiling, you can use this stuff and it will help to prevent the cracks reoccurring. No guarantee that it will, but you know, it goes a long way towards helping. It's basically rebar for plaster. You know, it, it reinforces the plaster. Back in the day, of course, we didn't use this. It was either Hessian or Jute screw or cotton screw. The cotton screw was absolute junk. You were guaranteed it cracked using the cotton screw. The Jute and the Hessian screw, a lot heavier, um, and they did kind of work, but on modern plasters, they didn't work. So, again, we've double taped that humongous crack there. And when you double take it, the, the, the little squares in your mesh, try and get them so they're not on top of each other, they're offset with each other, so it, it gives it a bit more strength. Now you could go to the extremes of taping your water sealing angles, um, but because we're not doing the, the whole room and the fact that there's no cracks there already, we're not going to bother doing that. Again, tomorrow we'll take down this uh, white fitting, ready for skimming. That probably be cracked on down there. Again, tape onto it. A little hairline crack there. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see how lovely it sticks. <sighs> right, so that's the ceiling taped up. I could go to the extremes of trying to bond out the, the bulge in the ceiling, but that would just be adding more weight to the already failing plasterboard. So it wouldn't really be a wise decision to do that. Um, however, I advised him it needs to come down and have a new boarded ceiling, but he, he, for whatever reason, doesn't want to do that. So um, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be a little bit tricky to skim. Chris will moan when he comes tomorrow with me to... Uh, to skim it all, um, but it'll moan anyway. Right, so I think the uh, the last and final bit is between the window frame and the window reveal is a gap. It's not massive, but there's a gap, a couple of millimetres. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape around that as well, which will reinforce it and stop it cracking out. Right, so the very, very last job we need to do now is to get the, uh, the soft brush and just go around that bead with a drop of water. And what have we got in here? With that one. Because the, uh, the two inch brush that I normally use for doing this is covered in PVA at the moment, it needs a wash. So, um, yeah, we can use that. You don't need to be heavy handed, it's very lightly, just give it a, a bit of a, a wipe up and down with some water and a, a brush, soft brush. And what that's doing is it's, it's removing any little lumps or ridges or anything like that around the bead where we've bedded it on. So that when we skin it, you're not, you're not hitting like a, a hard, dry bit of plaster work, it's all nice and even. By the time we come to do these tomorrow, we'll be absolutely solid and skim up a treat. And of course, doing it with a brush like this as well, it puts a series of fine lines into it. Although we'll, we'll probably just wet that up tomorrow, maybe even just give it a little bit of PVA first day and um, stop any suction. But those little lines from your brush just help two layers stick together. That's, that's pretty much how you prep for uh, over skimming. Um, there's nothing more to show. So I think we'll uh, we'll call that the end of part one, and we shall film tomorrow for part two, which will be the actual skimming of the walls and ceiling. So don't forget to look out for part two, which will be coming out very shortly. And as usual, I hope you've enjoyed this one. 
this is just another string to the bow for things that I do. Now, for anybody wondering, I am actually a qualified, fully qualified, time served plasterer. There's no second guessing on here. This is uh, basically how it's done and how it's been done for many years. Anyway, if you fancy subscribing to the channel, please feel free to do so. And don't forget, the likes, we need to get those likes in, they're very important. The more people that, that press the, the old thumbs up, the more people can see the videos and enjoy them. So don't forget, thumbs up, hit the like button, and we shall see you in part two.